wanted to first start by uh, get an idea of how comfortable everybody here is with theming uh, in Drupal. So uh, if you've ever themed before, just give a little, I like it, I like it. So uh, it depends on your definition. <laughs> <laughs> so to get an idea, because uh, I feel like, uh, like theming can be a frustrating process. So if anybody is currently frustrated with something in Drupal, we're gonna focus on the theming part, uh, but if, if we don't have enough frustration there, you can move on to some module things. And I will address your questions right off the bat. So uh, does anybody have anything uh, theme related that they're working on right now? Or? Well, it's really more of a question about um, when it comes to responsive design, um, getting things, that, like tables, for example, like, you know, to, to get them uh, smartphone friendly, you know, sure. um, and then, as, and especially third party, like, uh, iframes, I, I just recently discovered a couple of modules that help, like, make, like, YouTube videos, get them to reach size, and, and but like, you know, like, other embedded things, like Google calendars, and, uh, and that sort of thing, um, they tend to shove off to the right. Yeah, uh, so with tables in specific, uh, uh, there are a whole bunch of different uh, ways to go about it. And if you go to Chris Coyer's site, css-tricks.com, uh, if you do a Google search on responsive tables, that's gonna be the number one uh, hit that comes up. And uh, he makes a list of all the different libraries and things, including my really, really rudimentary one that he was kind enough to, uh, to include there. Um, so when it comes to tables, you have a bunch of options, and a lot of times it comes down to uh, the nature of the tabular data that you have there. Sometimes it's a scroll-based thing, sometimes it's uh, breaking each row into a kind of a box, things like that. So uh, you got a little bit of leeway there. When it comes to things like iframes and uh, things like the object tag and all the other different weird crazy things, uh, you usually just kind of make sure that the max width is 100% and call it a day. <laughs> like, there's not a lot you can do with it. Um, so that, that's pretty much it. Thanks. Hey, Fred. Yeah. Th that mic's just for the recording, so could I get you to step back in here and uh, oh. more into that? It's just a little tough to hear in the back of the room. Now. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, on the way here, uh, the other develop one of the other developers I work with told me that he saw me in a dream leaning against a table like a cool 80s teacher. And so I was trying to go for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, in the back. I would just ask you to speak up a little bit and just bring it right near you. Uh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anybody else with some theming concerns? Yes? So, uh, do you have a, a good alternative to Superfish for menus? For menus? Um, I tend to do uh, get as far as I can with CSS and then add on JavaScript as it is and usually it's a one-off or take it from a separate project or something. Uh, a lot of different libraries as I'm going to demonstrate uh, I find to have a lot of overhead that isn't necessary so uh, I guess my answer is kind of no <laughs> but uh, that's just kind of the nature of the beast. Dang it. All right I'll take one more of those before moving on so if anybody's got anything. Yes. Um, I, I find it's very hard to theme a uh, uh, building form, uh, like the uh, user sign up uh, form. Um, do you have any thoughts on how to do that properly? Um, well, what in particular do you... For example, if I want to have uh, some placeholder in a input box, uh, like Bootstrap does, mm -hmm. if I want to input that particular path, it's pretty hard. Um, and if you want to move around uh, those uh, input boxes, um, you sort of it's also pretty hard since you have to write a customized uh, JavaScript to do the moving around. For some of those things, uh, yeah, you can do you can work with JavaScript to do it, um, but on the PHP side of things, um, there's a certain amount of uh, adding weights to the form array to get things to move around, and then if you in the form API, if you if you have an array, um, you can add. Uh, attributes and then put placeholder in there and that will on its own uh, take care of any browser that supports the placeholder attribute uh, and it's coming from the system so uh, there's a pretty slick way uh, to uh, 
uh, get like the float label pattern that you may have seen in uh, uh, from some of those CSS demonstration sites and things. So that works out pretty well. All right, so I'm going to start on this. Uh, thank you for everybody uh, sharing the, the frustration so far. Um, maybe at the end of this, you might be more frustrated. So the first kind of precept that I, I have is uh, uh, make your slides work. Um, Okay, section one has to do with templates and helpers, and we've got CSS and we've got uh, resource loading. Uh, so uh, the first precept is less is more. Uh, there are a whole bunch of different ways to say it, but three words is pretty good. Uh, uh, in general, if you have to do less stuff or write less code, it's going to end up uh, being easier to maintain and doing a whole bunch of things. And maintenance is a really important part of a theme. So uh, uh, I wasn't able to find a really solid attribution for this, uh, but I can tell you that even if you disagree with me, I sleep fairly well, uh, and I keep this in mind fairly often. So yeah, less is more. So one of the things that I think is really nice and helps me sleep is knowing that all my page.tpl.phps are in order. I don't know if that factors into your, like if you like chamomile tea or something, I don't know what it, how you sleep, but that's, for me, that's good. So this is what a very simple page.tpl.php can look like. If you're looking at most themes that you get out of the box, your zens and so on and so forth, uh, it's nothing like this because they include the page title and tabs and uh, tons of wrappers and all this other stuff, and I think that's unnecessary. So. Uh, to get to this point, how do we do that, is really it's just installing one contrib module called Blockify. And I'm going to tell you that Blockify has changed my life, that uh, if there were a church of Blockify, I would probably go. Uh, and it's a very simple module. One time we accidentally rewrote it because we didn't know it existed. But it's, it's very good, so use that one. So, like I said, I love Blockify. And it's part of an overarching philosophy that we at Commercial Progression uh, kind of live by. So uh, the first mantra in this presentation is everything is a block. And uh, the way that this uh, kind of manifests itself is first, your page.tpl.php doesn't have all the things that Blockify uh, kind of turns into blocks for you, but also when you're thinking, hey, how should I implement this piece? Uh, sometimes things are pages, you know, sometimes things are fields, you know, there's a whole bunch of different Drupal lingo that goes along with it. But in general, if you're thinking, how should I do this? Block is a pretty decent answer. So it allows for, so having everything as a block allows for some uh, easier layout things. Uh, you know that everything that's going to be in a particular region is going to be in a block. It's going to have a title or not, and it's going to have content. And so you can do very simple layouts like this. This doesn't help all that much on its own, but if every block in there has to be laid out in a particular way, you can just target blocks. It also allows for you to configure your logo uh, and configure your tabs and do fun things like that. Um, and this is contextual links with just a little bit of CSS. Um, and it also allows you, this is uh, the page title block. It seems like every single site on the planet has the page title except on the front page. And usually that would be uh, some sort of conditional flag in a template. In the Blockify world, it's just uh, one little line there. And it's familiar, it's in the UI, people know how to do this. So Blockify, anybody, anybody not sold so far? OK. So less is more. Um, I may or may not repeat that slide. I don't know. Uh, so another piece that goes along with uh, this whole scheme, and if you were in this room a few minutes ago, uh, JD spent time talking about entities and all the cool things that go along with it. And one thing that comes along with entities are view modes. So what a view mode is, if you haven't uh, uh, 
dove that deep so far is uh, like the full content or the teaser, how things show up in tokens, how they show up in search results. Uh, all of those are configurable out of the box, but you can add additional ones. And so uh, one that we use fairly often is called slide. So if you're gonna have a node or an entity show up as a slide in a slideshow or something, uh, you can set that for every single entity. And then if you wanted to have a slideshow that was like mostly images, but then there's one that had a whole bunch of content in it, they could all be playing nice together and you can control it all from the UI. So uh, I really like views and I don't really even agree with my own slide. Uh, the, the thing that happens a lot in uh, inherited projects often is that we'll get these views and it's got uh, four displays in it and three of them all use the default fields but there are 10 fields in there and then the fourth display has 14 fields in it and one of them's all messed up and it's like really not fun to, to, to deal with. So uh, entity view modes, instead of declaring each field that you use in a view, lets you uh, just say, I want you to render out this entity using this view mode and then in the content UI, the field UI, you decide what you want to show in there. And so that can kind of help with things. So uh, fields are nice. And fields are nice for a whole bunch of different reasons, uh, as we shall now see, I think. Okay, so uh, along with fields, what you have, has anybody, who here has uh, ever made a field from scratch? Yeah, I like it. Uh, so a field is a, a few different things. The first part is storing data in the database. Then there's the widget, which is the form uh, piece for inputting that data from the UI. And then the last piece is the formatter, which is how do we want it to show to people uh, on the front end. And any field can have like an arbitrary number of formatters. Um, so like if you have a long text field, you could have one that's called plain text or, or trimmed or something like that. And so we've gotten into the habit of writing a lot of formatters, and here are a couple of examples. So the first one, field collection image link parent. Um, if you have a field collection that contains an image and you want to display it on a page with a bunch of other field collections, um, the link to uh, content that would be in there will actually take you to the field collection rather than to the node. So that formatter is like, no, that's stupid. Let's do it the other way. Um, field collection delta display lets you say, I want to show uh, two, at most two field collections out of the unlimited that you can enter, and I want to start with the third one, or something like Like you can uh, do things that you'd normally do in views, but you can do it in the, uh, in the content UI instead. Uh, display text formats <laughs> actually existed in uh, Drupal 6. In Drupal 7, it's a little, it's not quite as nice. So if I wanted to save something as full HTML, but show it as markdown, or like do some, something where the two filter formats uh, don't necessarily agree with each other, uh, display text format lets you do that from the manage display tab. Uh, media element responsive, uh, really just make sure that those media element.js videos uh, never get too big. Uh, file link and file big icons are both ways to display files that uh, should just live on their own. So one aspect of themes that is a little daunting if you're not really big in PHP is the template.php. Uh, when you get Zen or Omega or something for the first time, you look in a template.php and it's all this commented out jazz. You're like, what should I do with it? So there are two primary things that I put in template.php that I don't put other places instead. So the first is pre-process functions. Uh, so if you have a block and you want to send every block uh, an, an additional 
value, like, uh, not even the author name or something, like some uh, extra little piece, you can say, hey, before you send uh, data to the template, here's this additional thing that you can then uh, read from that template. So preprocess functions can do some other stuff too, but for the most part, um, passing stuff to templates is their, is their job. Um, and then these are theme functions, so uh, it would be overriding uh, uh, a default theming function. And I do it with buttons on the front end theme because by default, if you, if you theme button, it's gonna make it an input or something like that, which for CSS is not as much fun as just having a button element. And it happens that Drupal attributes will actually just pass exactly what you need for the button. So there's no love lost there. Um, the other way that you can do a theme override is in a module using um, hook theme registry alter and uh, then writing a separate theming function and just saying use this function instead. And one problem that you'll run into is uh, it'll happen on every theme that you use unless you override it again. So if you have an admin theme and you uh, have a site-wide override for buttons, uh, you may find that everything breaks. So it's a good idea to put some of these theming functions uh, in the, in the template.php rather than uh, doing a theme registry alter. So that's mostly template.php. Uh, sometimes you, <coughs> like, maybe like a page alter or something like that uh, if you really need to, but then there are performance concerns. So when it comes to templates, my best advice is to don't have very many of them. Uh, <coughs> typically, if you're going to have uh, templates, the best way to handle them is at the smallest level possible. So uh, having a field template rather than changing page.tpl and having <laughs> like four page.tpls or things like that, that tends to work better than, so going from small to large rather than the other way around. Um, well, I, I, I get happy when I see themes that only have three or four templates in them. The other guideline uh, has to do with those entity view modes. And in both of these cases, it's not uh, like a hard and fast rule. Sometimes you really want to do things in templates because that's the way to do it. Um, and sometimes you, your views should be fields. Uh, but it's a good question to ask any time that you're making a view is, should I just do this as a rendered entity instead of uh, going through the process of adding all these fields? Well, I'm really plowing through this stuff, I think. We can, we can chill out afterwards. Uh, so now I'm gonna talk about CSS, which is the most likely place where my voice uh, uh, will, would intentionally be raised. <laughs> so once again, less is more. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna try to, to cram all the philosophy in here. Um, oh. Less is more, but not less. I'm not a big fan of CSS preprocessors, as um, as my my first th line here is take pride in avoiding SAS. Uh, if you want to come and see me at lunch and argue a lot, we can do that. Um, I don't like uh, CSS preprocessors because they are a leaky abstraction, and um, a lot of the main touted features of them are ways to do things badly. Also, I often distrust libraries, not always, um, and we're kind of in the process of making a bunch of internal libraries. So uh, really, like the, the little disclaimer there would be, often distrust libraries unless you wrote them yourself. Um, and then don't repeat yourself. Um, or others. So that goes along with the libraries and the sassing. Um, if you're going to write something for an H2, don't, don't override your H2 later in some silly fashion. So 
I'm not sure that this is all going to make a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense in my head. So there are a few things I have no patience for, and this is probably the ideal place for me to really just raise my voice. Uh, so the first thing I don't have patience for are things that you drop in that you don't touch. So reset and normalize are great examples of that. Uh, I love a lot of the CSS that's in normalize.css, and I've taken that and stole, and stole it and um, put it into something that's an actual working file instead of uh, having what's more or less a reset. I also don't like breaking CSS into separate files. This is another thing that we can argue about. Uh, I like to have one big CSS file and every once in a while go to the bottom of the file and read the line number and go, oh, I'm not you know, wasting people's bandwidth. So the le like, it's another one of those, uh, I can sleep better at night knowing that I kept this huge project under 1,200 lines or something. Um, and a lot of times, because you're declaring elements at a general level, uh, the top you know, 400 lines or so are more or less the same from project to project, and it covers things like forms. Um, and then uh, one part that, that when it, like footer.css is especially weird to me, partly because uh, of the whole regions thing, I can show you a, a CSS file uh, of how to deal with the Blockify philosophy. Uh, so each region kind of just gets colored and, and laid out. But when you have a site, it's you more or less have a wrapper and then the main content area. And as long as the main content area abides by certain rules, you're kind of set to go. So footer.cs is just weird. Uh, another thing I really don't like, uh, this uh, declaration for A, for, for links, does nothing. It declares all the default values. So what I think a, a CSS file that's successful does is uh, only declares things that are different. So if you change the color, that would be the only line that you would change. Um, yeah, anybody? Okay. Uh, this, I don't like. Um, so this is a really over-specific uh, declaration or a selector. Um, and uh, it's just not even, it just doesn't even look nice. Maybe that's the, the real problem with it. Uh, I don't want to get too much into that. Does anybody really disagree that, that having selectors like that is okay? Um, so then another thing would be having a class that really is meant just for a regular element. So there's not really a circumstance where you should say this span should look like an H2. That's ridiculous. Just make it an H2. If it's not semantically an H2, then there's a problem with your markup, not with your CSS. Um, I think this is really inelegant. It's, uh, it's, it came from somebody who I, who I respect, and I think, I think what really gets me about it is not just the performance concern that goes along with it, which people say is negligible, but uh, I don't know, it's just wrong. Like, it, <laughs> Like, if you have an area that should be border box, just make that area border box rather than making the entire site and every single element there. Using anything with the universal selector, the star, uh, is probably ill-advised. So that was the, the negative part. Here are a few things that I like, and I'll try to make this code more available uh, if you wanted to just paste it into your projects, which I'm sure that you will because it's just the best ideas. <laughs> So the first would be utility classes, and in conjunction with the Blockify module, most sites that we have also use the Block class module. And so if we wanted to make um, the footer menu be pipe separated, uh, we can just add that class to that menu block, and then any list item that's in there 
is going to have a pipe after it, except for the last one, because that would look really silly. So utility classes. Um, you can see that I have an empty declaration at the top. Uh, that's really more just uh, for organization, and we want to strip that out before we send it out to uh, end users. Uh, I really like big.info files in my themes. Um, and I like to override every single CSS thing that has ever been added to uh, by core or contrib. So uh, node.css is really kind of useless if you're going to be making your own node class. Um, so really under the, the red, I don't have patience for thing, I should have had a slide that said, um, I don't like having overriding uh, CSS declarations. So I want to declare it once and know that it's going to do what it's doing. So I wanted to put a puppy in there. Give you a couple seconds. <laughs> All right. Uh, another thing I like is responsive trickery. Um, if you're building a site and, uh, and you have some number of anticipated IE8 or smaller users, uh, you want your layout to not be all squishy when you uh, uh, make your browser window smaller. So this uh, declares a width on uh, uh, region inner for 960, uh, 960 pixels, but on any browser that uh, accepts media queries, the width is going to be its own thing. So uh, IE8 and smaller are going to make a 960 pixel page, whereas all the rest um, are going to go, OK, I can respond to that. Also, um, I like to put media queries per little module piece. So like in that pipe-spaced utility class, that particular piece at 500 pixels or whatever breakpoint you decide uh, could no longer show the, the pipe spacing and go to like line by line or something. And you can just copy out that, that class and take it somewhere else. Uh, and so you know where your media queries are working. Um, so who here uses grid systems? OK. I, I'm not saying that you're a terrible person, um, but so going back to the idea that uh, a page is made up of this wrapper and then a main content area, uh, usually there's a lot of overhead there. So if you're making a really complex application with just a crazy layout, then the grid system makes a lot of sense and, and good decision. If you're just laying things out normally, uh, this more or less takes care of laying out things in a in a grid like pattern. Wow, I didn't. I haven't talked about nearly enough CSS. Um, so a resource payload. So uh, this last little piece has to do with uh, you've got images and and icons and fonts and things, um, and what's the best way to to get those out to your users. So the first. Um, uh, this just in the middle of things. Um, clear them, caches and cookies. <laughs> so uh, fonts are part of a site. So uh, if you use Google Web Fonts, what you're, when you do that, you're making a call, and it's putting a CSS file in there that's saying, uh, pull in all these resources. So at minimum, it's a chain of two things. If you declare your fonts in your main CSS file, you can get it down to one. <laughs> and so uh, one is smaller than two the last time I checked. Um, and it's so when it comes to caching and other aspects of performance, of, of front end performance, uh, serving fonts from your own site uh, is usually better than using a third party service. And so here's. Uh, a declaration for font face. Uh, and I've included the italic uh, variation of the same. So as long as the font family name is the same, you can uh, say that the italic one is in a different file. You can see I've got EOT and WAF. Uh, you might find like uh, a whole bunch of other file formats like SVG and so forth. 
you're going to cover all of your bases with just EOT and LOF, so I don't mess with all the other stuff. Uh, so I know that social icons can be done a million ways because I've done them about 255,000 and kind of just rounded up. Uh, so here's the right way to do it. Um, I'm going to kind of, I'm sorry, recording device. Uh, so the first thing is taking the text that's in the link. So if you have a link that says like facebook.com slash Brad, uh, uh, it's just going to not show the text in it. And then before it, it's going to insert an icon. If you don't have a, some, okay, in the next slide, uh, if you don't have something that supersedes it, it's going to use an external link. Uh, so the content here is the Unicode character for what we use for external links. Um, and it's coming from this Fontello. So we just made one big Fontello font that uh, contains every imaginable icon that we'd ever want to use. And um, it just styles it out in a very basic way. So it's got a great background. Um, and the text is in white. And then when you hover, there's a little effect to it. Uh, and so that's the overridable social icon piece. And so then for each uh, service that you use, um, rather than classing it or doing something like that, uh, we're using a, uh, a CSS 2.1 selector for attributes. Uh, finding whether the href attribute contains facebook.com. If it does, it switches the, uh, the Unicode character from external link to a really funky looking F. And then um, uh, when you hover over it, it's going to be in Facebook blue. And so we have this really big file, and we include it in our compro underscore custom module. Uh, and you can turn it on and off through the UI. Um, and a, a bunch of themes and uh, what, what are those? Uh, a bunch of themes and other modules uh, tack onto that. If you'll excuse me for one moment. I don't really think I have very much to go. Okay, so yeah, less is more. Um, so fewer uh, uh, things in the payload being sent to end users is better. Uh, having one icon font rather than um, multiple social icon images is better. Uh, having a single declaration for your uh, for a H, for an element in your CSS is better than having more than one. Uh, and having one template for fields or for pages or for blocks is better than having more than them. So, um, if you're worried about psychopathic killers. Uh, that's the way to uh, to avoid it. <coughs> At the same time, if you want to theme badly, uh, you will be giving me work, so thank you. <laughs> and thank you again for coming to this presentation. I think you made the right decision. <laughs> I got like 20 minutes for questions. If anybody wants to just come and do their own presentation too, that's cool. <laughs> yes. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm already afraid you're going to yell at me. Okay. Um, panels. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I've only used it on one site, so I was just. Curious. Panels on its own um, has a use case but as a mechanism for a front-end developer to lay out a site is it, it causes more a lot of trouble so uh, it's good if you need to have your end users change things around because then you have a it's adding a UI for it but what I found some inherited sites is like um, they'll use the page manager and then they'll make all these panels and then point URLs to them and it doesn't really accomplish much if you only have like one node in the in the panel uh, because really all you're doing is hiding the edit tab like it's not really accomplishing much so um, uh, I'm not saying don't use panels but just uh, uh, 
really the main use case would be for end users who need to change layout well, aspects. But, but the main, the main, I, like I said, I'm only using it on one site and I'm using it very lightly just for a few key pages that the client needs to get into. But um, problem, and this ties in with my original question, is the problem that I run into is, is that it there's, doesn't seem to be a way, unless I'm doing it wrong, there doesn't seem to be a way to make that responsive because it, it's, you know, it's, it's still all, you know, you have two columns or three columns, it's still all within the uh, content area, so it's not like you can, you know, right. like a region or something. Well, the, the cascading part of CSS kind of, uh, that's a lot of the reason why I want to override all those files and things is you can kind of include a lot of the panels CSS along in your in your theme file um, and that way you don't have to have some override that's like body space dot panel or whatever like like uh, there's no need for those sort of uh, hacks or importance or anything like that we really do have like 20 minutes. Is, <laughs> yeah, I, feel. I had a, a piggyback question. Um, you mentioned that the clients need to be able to change things around. How do you, usually the client says they need to, and they never do <laughs> Right. <laughs> Dummy interface, and say, I know you're never going to use this page. <laughs> <laughs> I would I ask for it, and that, I just never see anyone use it well, I guess. Yeah. I would encourage the dummy underscore panels module. That's cool. I like it. <laughs> We're coming out with productive things from this. Cool. Yeah. You talked about avoiding specificity. Do you use anything like BEMS or SMACs or anything, uh, any of those techniques in your CSS? Or yeah. Can that be used with your Ruby? But I, I don't even know. Yeah. Um, I like to maintain uh, six or seven different coding standards for my CSS in, <laughs> in any given theme. Uh, there's there's promise to that. Uh, like you can see, like with the utility classes. A lot of it is single class. Like, there's no uh, bunch of dashes saying this is what this does, or anything. like, I don't know. I I don't hate them, but they're they're cool. Yeah. So you mentioned blocked file, which I have not looked at. But what is the performance implications of making everything blocked? I don't know. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot, a lot of uh, performance questions when it comes to rendering from the back end, I just kind of defer to core caching. So, somebody else is responsible. Yeah, it's somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, with Blockify, I, I've seen it once, but I glanced over it because I didn't hear about release in 2011. Sure. When you guys evaluate modules, is that a concern? And yes and no. Uh, it's a, it's one of the criteria among a whole bunch. When it comes to Blockify, there is activity on the dev branch, uh, and so that kind of is encouraging. There's one sort of thing which I try, uh, which I'm happy doesn't come up all that much, is that the breadcrumb block in Blockify will sometimes not take uh, hook like hooked changes to the breadcrumbs, but otherwise there's really not a lot of reason for them to have to update it all that much. Uh, like I said, we uh, went through the process of more or less writing Blockify, and it's not that much code to do it. Yes? The question kind of surrounds uh, the theme key project. Um, so I mean, I have a, a project where it's kind of a self-provisioning system, so someone can create an account upload the logo, can have their own path-based or sub-domain-based uh, uh, portion of the site okay. uh, for their own information, own content. Um, I mean, is it opinions on that project? Is there a better way to go about it, best practices? Do you have, like, multiple themes they can choose from? Uh, correct. So, I mean, they would, um, in a sense, they have the ability to change the look of their own version of the site. Um, so, different colors, logo, stuff right. like that. That sounds really cool. Uh, so you've been digging into the color module, or are right. they? Right. Then, okay. then I mean, theme key with um, you know being able to um, you know, code different portions of the site, um, either taxonomy based or path based um, stuff. So just wondering. Um, I guess I don't really have a, anything to. That sounds really neat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, sometimes uh, I want to uh, use a static HTML file for my homepage. Uh, it's just this one file. Uh, very different from the rest of the theme. 
Okay. Um, what's the standard way of doing that? Um, just a separate one page for the home page. Um, well, assuming um, that there's not really any sort of user concern for that, um, I kind of I, I guess I might look into um, uh, maybe like maybe doing it in Apache or doing it through your web server so that you can keep that stuff out of your core directory. But otherwise, yeah, you're, as long as you're pointing your index correctly. You could really even just drop that in as index.html and, and call it a day. Just, just make that the default. Yeah. Why not page front? Page front? Yeah. Well, if it's a static HTML file. But if you put it in as page front, you use static code, and then it would be removed. It's true. He makes a good point. <laughs> I, I guess I'll trust the security maintainer guy, whatever. <laughs> yeah. The question of the block file, I'm familiar with it. Blocks have been very hard to export. You know, so if you have a workflow going from environment to environment, uh, it's clearly, uh, how, in your experience, uh, have you needed to be able to export blocks that block might provide to do so if not, uh, or change, make changes? If, like, uh, uh, well, if you if you had been in the, the Git and Features uh, presentation, <laughs> uh, uh, so when it comes to Blockify, you don't need to put the block settings into features. Um, but like block placement, uh, you can kind of do trickery where uh, you would make a feature that places all your blocks for you based on your dev, uh, and then turn it on and turn it off. And it's really hacky. A lot of times, it's just like, why not just move it? And so you, like oftentimes, um, for like a dev to stage deploy, uh, where I've made substantial changes, I'll really just have two tabs open to make sure that both the block UIs look the same. It's not the best thing in the world. It's not uh, enterprise grade uh, dev process, but it gets stuff done. Yes? It, it could be one reason for it. If you're evaluating block types, panels, or contexts, panels, contexts, or contexts are a little bit more exploitable. Sure. Um, you know, depending on the rules that you write, Sure. Well, I guess a lot of the blocks that that uh, we create with the everything is a block are like views or sometimes things that are made in custom modules. So a lot of the things that you would make a block for in the UI or things where the block content would have to be exported are hopefully fairly rare. So like we have a module internally called contact info. And since every site ever wants to have like their address and their phone number, it's like we have a, a admin page that has it all split out. Um, you put in like your Twitter handle and your Google Plus thing, and you can use that as a token into meta tag. And then all those social icons, there's a little UI for that too. So like we're making blocks that we're going to be reusing. And then the, uh, the one little hitch is like just making sure that they're getting placed. not to use preprocessors that seems like kind of a controversial statement. Uh, can you maybe talk just a little bit about that? Why why would you not want to use uh, something like SAS? Sure. The okay up until recently I was kind of talking out of my butt because I hadn't really used SAS all that much and I found an opportunity with a Jekyll based site that I was making to play with it a little bit and uh, using variables for colors while I still see that it's not great, um, has a certain advantage, uh, especially when uh, two colors, or, or like uh, you want to use a function to change a color and have the whole theme change on, based on something. That's pretty neat. Um, so there are like little aspects of SAS or, or any preprocessor that uh, can be nice for the workflow at the same time things like nesting or mix-ins or extends and things like that uh, are more or less saying you should do things using this this tool that you wouldn't do using regular CSS and I think that's bad so like 
if somebody nests three levels in or something, they're making these ridiculous selectors and they never see that they're making ridiculous selectors. So having a really good handle on CSS before ever thinking about touching uh, SAS and Compass. Because like the other part about Compass is there are all these names and things that you need to learn uh, in order to put these different mixins and things into your uh, into your SAS file. But why not just learn this, the CSS spec and instead? Like, and then you'd know what's going on there. So that's a couple of things. But if you want to... It's more about how you use it. Now. Absolutely. And the theory behind it. recently, in the last two or three weeks, there have been three or four different SAS style guide, kind of generalized ones. And when you read them, you're like, half of these sections say, don't use this feature or like don't nest more than one level deep or something like and you're like well why are you using this tool if most of the stuff you're using it for shouldn't be used <laughs> but that's just me if you want to use SAS that's cool I yeah. just wanted to make sure it was clear for everybody you did mention you wanted everything in one CSS file mm -hmm. it's nice and, nice and uh, easy clear mm -hmm. um, and yet I don't know if everybody's familiar with the info file and you know all those CSS files <laughs> Sure. Uh, to kind of clarify on that, uh, so there's one included CSS file in my themes, and that's the CSS file that I'm working from. And then in the .info file, all of those override declarations. So like if you have book.css and it's for all media, uh, you don't even need to have that file as long as you declare it in your .info file it's going to override the core one that's being pressed. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I assume they're going to be talking about this you know, uh, later on, or at the end of the day, about the, the Drupal 8 one. But I just figured that if you have the time, um, I don't know how much you know, you've played around with 8 so far, but in terms of theming, I know that there's supposed to be like some big differences sure. in 7 to 8. Uh, I think it was just before the beta one, um, I went through the process of taking the theme that I usually base everything off of, which is not a base theme. It's like, it's its own theme and then I just uh, adapt it. Um, I took that and put all the stuff into twig files and then stripped out all the stuff from, uh, I think it was the Bartik uh, that comes out of the box, um, stripped out all the stuff that Blockify would take care of, and I went to project slash Blockify and found that they hadn't uh, made an eight branch yet, and was a little bit upset. And then I installed Composer and was like, uh, uh, and then got the console and was like, I'm going to make a module. I'm going to, and then um, was like, oh, I have actual work. <laughs> so, okay, well, I'm getting the two minute signal. Uh, is, if anybody has anything else pressing. Uh, go right now. Otherwise, come catch me at lunch and uh, go see uh, Chris and Andy, uh, and they're going to refute some of the things that I said, and that'll be fun. Thanks, everybody.